So, I'm writing a novel. Is the show where you join me, Oliver Brackenbury, on the journey of writing my next novel, from first ideas all the way to publication and promotion. In this one-man reality show, I'll share with you my ever-evolving thoughts and feelings on how I write, being a writer, and everything that entails at each stage of the process. I'll also answer listener questions and, sometimes, interview people who write fiction. If you're the kind of person who likes to learn how things are made and get to know the people making them, then this is the show for you. I might have to change that sometimes part of the intro because this is once again an interview episode. In my sword and sorcery research, I haven't just been reading like some kind of a loser. I've been listening to podcasts like some kind of super cool person who can do no wrong. <laughs> One podcast I've been listening to is called Rogues in the House, which is also the name of a classic Robert E. Howard Conan story. Rogues in the House is centered entirely on sword and sorcery, discussing it as it manifests in fiction across all mediums, including art and many kinds of gaming. It's hosted by three friends. Alex, Logan, and Matt, who sometimes have guests on like artist Sarah Frazetta or author Scott Oden, but just as often cover a subject all by themselves, always in a loose, fun, hanging out with your buddies kind of vibe. Perhaps showing a bit of bias for my fellow Canadian in the bunch, I've invited Matt, full name Matt John, to be interviewed here on So I'm Writing a Novel. Matt is a podcast host, yes, but also an author and game designer. He's done work on the Terminator role-playing game for Nightfall Games, the Age of Conan RPG for Modifius, and his latest short story has been accepted to that marvelous sword and sorcery magazine, Tales from the Magician's Skull. When he isn't doing all kinds of fun stuff like that, Matt's a teacher. All right, he lives out in the Maritimes, so let's see if we can hear the ocean when we cut to the interview right now. And here we are with Matt John. Hey, man. Hey, how's it going? Not too bad. Let's do the podcast thing. You may be familiar with it from the show Rogues in the House. <laughs> I have done some podcasts. Yes, I, uh, <laughs> I am on a show called Rogues in the House. What was your introduction at however young an age it was to sword and sorcery? Ah, great question. So for sword and sorcery, uh, it's kind of hard to reach back that far and absolutely give you the honest. Well, no, I'll give you my honest answer. The one that I know, you know, the one that according to to my memory is true. And the earliest uh, sword and sorcery adjacent thing I remember is Masters of the Universe with He-Man. And my memory has them as almost simultaneous with a couple of things. Masters of the Universe, the action figures, and the television show. Conan the Destroyer and Conan the Barbarian issue 101, I think it is. It's the issue after Bellet uh, or Baylit dies. I don't even remember. I'm like a Conan guy and I keep messing up. I hear Bel Belit or Beli, silent T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right Beli. <laughs> um, it's one of those things, no matter what, I'm never going to get it straight in my memory now because I've already messed it up, you see? Yeah, now so you've got the wanna... USB problem where half the time you plug it in, you should get it right, it's... but you always seem to get it wrong the first time. Yeah. <laughs> I never heard that analogy. That's perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what's going on. So it's it's the episode, or the, uh, the comic after... That I think it's 101 and Conan's in like uh, the Black Kingdom somewhere and he's on the cover. He's fighting a, a Kushite uh, on a log and below is this really awesome John Buscema styled uh, spider. And I have vivid memories as a kid at my grandfather's cottage after having seen that comic cover and like sort of reenacting that battle scene. So my earliest memories with Sword and Sorcery, sadly, are really nothing to do with literature. They're to do with Saturday morning cartoons and comic books. Well, that's all good. I asked you about your earliest exposure, right? It was sort of unlikely yeah, yeah. that you would have picked up like, uh, you know, red nails when you were four or five or <laughs> be impressed that's, if you did. That's a strong, um, a strong brew for a, for a four or five year old. And it's funny you mentioned He-Man because yeah, of course, like he's basically sword and planet and I yeah. should, that actually should be my honest answer too, but I always uh, forget and I say Savage Sword of Conan, the black and white magazine format one where mm. they can get away with a bit of like TNA and violence because it was a yeah, magazine. Yeah. But yeah, no, I guess it was He-Man for me too, actually. Huh. <laughs> yeah, well, S Savage Sword kind of was, was kind of like another stepping stone for me. When I was in high school, I got some of the you know, the older Lancer Conan books and started reading those. And I was like, geez, these are cool. They're unlike anything else I've read. And then I also simultaneously went to the comic store and you got that wicked Earl Norum painting where Conan is kind of standing atop. It's it's a riff on the Frazetta painting, but he's got that big axe. Mm -hmm. 
He's kind of wearing a vest. That one absolutely blew my mind and kind of, I'd like to say, sealed the deal, that cover. <laughs> and that was it? You were, yeah. you were in for life? No, no, like seven year breaks from the, you know, the genre or the hobby or anything like that? Yeah, no. Uh, like uh, high school thereafter. And then when I went into film school, I started to become, re- I, I got really into it. And then uh, I kind of decided I wasn't going to go into film and learn history and literature. And then, well, those who can't <laughs> teach. And then on the side, oh, those, those who the want side, to make a regular gigs. living, from, take it from someone who yeah. swims around in the film and TV side of things. Woof. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those who want job security, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, join a union, I guess. Yeah. How fluid do you feel the definition of sword and sorcery is? Because I feel like it's safe to say, uh, not that we're close buddies, but we've chatted a little bit now on the Whetstone Discord server. I've kind of seen some of the conversations mm. you're involved in, and it seems like you two have encountered a lot of people arguing over, like, what is sword and sorcery? Does it matter? Uh, and I know that's kind of a big open-ended to do, and we could do like an hour just on that. But like it's got to it's yeah. got to be defined to a certain degree or it's meaningless. But if it's too rigid, then it becomes stated and kind of dies and becomes a museum piece. Where do you sit? Yeah. On that? And, and be, so I'm, I'm kind of aligned with what you just said. So I hate gatekeeping. I, I think I hate it because I feel like I sort of used to be that. And then as I grew up and realized, oh, my God. That's an ugly thing. That's no good. That's no good for anything to be like, oh, well, I was there before it was cool. You know, what the hell is that? That's no good for anything. It's not good for a property. It's not good for a genre, I don't think. But like you said, I think you do need to, you need to champion it a bit and you need to define it a bit because then otherwise anything with a sword and sorcery involved becomes sword and sorcery. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally sympathetic with, you know, people who get a little upset about the definition being watered down. Like there's a, I, I've brought this up on, on our podcast before where it's like, it's a board game called Sword and Sorcery. And it's like, if there's a whole board game called Sword and Sorcery, like, damn it, it should be a Sword and Sorcery kind of board game. I say this with bias as someone who works on the most pure Sword and Sorcery board game called Conan uh, by Monolith. <laughs> I can't take credit for writing the whole game, but I, you know, I've, I've, I've had my uh, fingers in the pie as it were. <laughs> so I guess I would say I'm kind of, uh, I've been speaking with uh, characters like Scott Oden and Howard Andrew Jones, and uh, actually a couple of fellows from the Chromecast too. And I, I feel like we need to kind of relax a little bit not put the gatekeepery thing in there. Like nobody enjoys on social media when you go, uh, actually, uh, that's not sword and sorcery. Even though I've done that, <laughs> but I try to do it now with a with a little better of a tone, mm-hmm. right? I, I'm in a Facebook group called um, Sword and Sorcery Movies of the 1980s or something. And there's a lot of people saying, you know, Willow is sword and sorcery and it's a lot of like the same thing as with that board game, right? Like these things are sword and sorcery because they involve swords and sorcery. And I feel like we we should champion, you know, the Liber definition, the sort of Howard stories to make it something special and something different. Um, but at the same time, we need to be open to it progressing. Yeah. Because that's my biggest biggest reservation with the genre is that it will go stale. It has become stale at points. And... I feel like there's a lot of gatekeeping. So how do we move it forward without defining it at all? I feel like we kind of have to a bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, I'm curious, have you read Brian Murphy's book, Flame and Crimson, A History of Sword and Sorcery? I haven't. It's not even on my to-be-read list, but it's on my to-buy-and-read list. I've heard a lot of good things. Okay, well, I won't go on too much, but uh, I have, and I have found it very useful. And what I really like is his approach where he comes up with sort of seven things that he feels like, you don't have to have all seven of these things but if you've got like, yeah. you know, more than four or four or more kind of thing, roughly speaking, you've got a sword and sorcery story. Uh, and he really stresses mm-hmm. that like if anything, one thing is missing or two things are missing or even three or four, you know, that's fine. Whatever. As long as it's got the right feel, as long as it's got like, say, you know, magic is the dark and terrible and risky thing, not like an easy thing, like a tools box. As long as your hero is sort of self-motivated, yeah. it doesn't have to be a jerk, it can even be a little heroic, right? Have an ethical code, but he's, yeah, you yeah. Know, he or she is going to be kind of out for themselves a little more. And it's going to uh-huh. be a little more like, even if they're in the middle of a big epic scale story, it's going to be kind from the bottom looking up perspective just stuff like that like he kind of mm-hmm. has his own little checklist and gets into details of what they are and it's the best one i've seen so far in what in terms of definitions that i've seen that are and i think part of it is because it's fluid because he says look here's seven things if you got like enough that it feels right you're good and because it has that kind of like yeah. scalability of like i got all seven or i got four and it feels right either way you're good 
know, it's, it's a flexible yeah, definition. Wow. I, yeah, I love, I mean, without having read it and with what you just described, I love that because it's very interesting. If you take something like Carl Edward Wagner's Kane stories, and then you take something like Liber's stories, especially his stories with a lot of levity, mm-hmm. and then you take something like Moorcox, Elric, there's a lot of different things going on there. Yet most people would agree they belong in the, uh, under the sword and sorcery banner. So yeah, the idea of having like, you know, your best three out of seven or whatever, that, that kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think so. Because yeah, you got you to have some of that flexibility, like we were saying, but you got to have some lines. And so it kind of achieves that middle ground of, of, yeah, like flexible, but there. It's not nothing. It's not watered down, I don't think. Yeah, I almost feel like my, my non-starter with it, and again, I could change my mind on this, but it is the first thing you said with, if sorcery is all altruistic and there's no cost to it. I don't really care, uh, you know, whether we can call it sword and sorcery or not. I'm kind of disinterested. Yeah. I don't like altruistic sorcery as a, as a matter of taste. I like it as something dark, something as, uh, you know, an, an overall metaphor for power and megalomania. Again, the story doesn't need to be about that, but I do not want altruistic schools of magic. That kind of just, I don't know. I don't want to read that story so much. Yeah, well, maybe it comes from a similar place where, like, for me, one thing I really love about the genre is that uh, when it's done right, <laughs> gatekeeping, there we go. Um, <laughs> when it's done the way I like it, which is the most important thing in the world because it's mm-hmm. me, It's uh, it's got everything feels kind of like there's a cost and therefore everything feels kind of earned. Whether the tone is more a life, yeah. you know, a Fafnir Grey Mouse or farting around Lankmar or Elric having the most tragic mm-hmm. day because he's killed five more of his relatives with his magic sword when he didn't mean to. Uh, spoiler, <laughs> sorry, everybody, that's his thing. Um, yeah. It. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there you go, right? So, I mean, we, like I said, that, this could easily be the whole hour, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. And yeah, I, I huge recommendation for Brian Murphy's book. Uh, by all means, get it, man. I think you'd really like it. I, you know, I, you definitely know more about the genre than I do, but I have been studying it pretty rigorously the last few years. And I was pleased to see that even having read as much as I have, have taken advantage of living by an archive where I can check out first editions of all the stuff, including Carl Wagner, who is hard to find in print <laughs> uh, for, yeah, for, for not yeah, a lot of pennies. Yeah. I, I was constantly learning stuff and adding stuff to my reading list. And just, yeah, it's a good, it's a solid book. But I'm interviewing you, not Brian, sorry. So as a little follow-up to the sword and sorcery, <laughs> uh, you know, the inevitable, what is it, uh, question. You wrote, I thought, a pretty good essay on Grimdark and Robert E. Howard oh, ooh, about a year ooh. ago. Uh, we have caused a link to it in Whetstone yeah. today, which is why I, I spotted that, gave it a read. Now, like, I'll link to that in the show notes, by the way, so other people can check it out. Uh, but yeah, maybe your opinions have changed. It's been a year. Is, mm-hmm. is Grimdark, uh, which for those who are listening and going, what is that? Uh, to me, my personal definition of what I've read, which is not all of it by far, is uh, uh-huh. it's kind of like that old Monty Python joke about like, how do you tell who isn't the king? You know, every, you know, everybody else is covered in shit. And it seems kind of like in Grimdark, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it can feel sort of sorcery-ish, but just like everybody's rough. Everything's rough. You know, people get great yeah, yeah. moments of respite, but overall it's, it's, it's a rough, rough, rough world. And it doesn't have, I mean, what I've seen so far, uh, some of the sense of awe and grandeur that occasionally gets into sword and sorcery. Definitely way less of the like heroics that can find their way in there. Anyway, Point being, sorry, I'm explaining this to the listener, not you. How do, how do you feel? Do you feel that Grimdark is maybe the successor to Sword and Sorcery, a parallel variant, its own thing? Where does it fit? So uh, that's very interesting. And <laughs> you said something there that, uh, yeah, I, I tend to really agree with. It is rough, but that is, the difference is Sword and Sorcery has those like jaw-dropping vistas, you know? It's got those like moments of awe. In Sword and Sorcery, you're not going to get a cut on your arm, have it fester and die. Whereas in a lot of Grimdark, you're going to have that. That said, and yes, thank you for citing my essay. I, 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 I did actually put a lot of thought in that because when I took the assignment and I started sort of outlining it, I was like, can I even argue this? And the more I kind of dug in and really used Howard's heroes as my anchor, um, I realized that, yeah, there's a lot of, there are a lot of similarities. So in some ways, I feel like the sword and sorcery fans of uh, yesterday, a lot of them who don't keep reading the same stories over and over again, have somewhat graduated to, I don't want to say graduated, that seems like you've improved. I I guess it's just that, yeah, they moved on to where the market is spitting out material that they'll like. There's a bit of an edge to it. It's violent. It's harsh. And I think sword and sorcery is that. But the difference really is that sword and sorcery, I think, has more uh, more heroics, right? Even if it is for self-motivation, if it's not necessarily altruistic, it seems even by proxy, a lot of the sword and sorcery characters end up heroic. Now, it seems as though, uh, I mean, a lot of 
quote unquote grimdark you'll read, you won't really have those heroes. But it seems to me that in a lot of grimdark, one of the things that happens is the characters end up doing something that regardless of what they do, things are still damned. Mm -hmm. And things still don't turn out well. And they're often not happy in the end. Sword and sorcery, sometimes it's a lot of times it's they carry on to fight another day. And in and in Grimdark, not necessarily. Yeah, like in Sword and Sorcery, I never get the feeling of, while we barely delayed the inevitable, I guess that's a win. <laughs> Which you sometimes get. <laughs> like Grimdark or like yeah. trying to think about it Cthulhu um stuff. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, and and I mean I don't know, because here's here's what happens in my head when I think about Grimdark. I think of R. Scott Baker, and then I think of Joe Abercrombie. And reading those two authors are completely different, yet most people agree they're somewhere under this Grimdark banner. And R. Scott Baker is humorless, it is grim, it is almost cynical, and it's just absolutely brutal. Like, nobody wins, except for... Maybe the people you don't want Sorry, to. Can I interrupt for a sec? I'm still, I'm just barely getting my toes yeah. into uh, Grimdark. Is he the guy who wrote Black Company? Yeah, yeah. What's his big thing? No, that is, uh, that's Glenn right. Cook. And Glenn Cook and Joe Abercrombie, there's definite similarities when you read those two. But R. Scott Baker is more like, he wrote um, The Darkness That Comes Before, uh, Warrior Prophet, Thousandfold Thought. And this is, it's sort of like, it's kind of based on the Crusades, okay. but like, it, it's it's a cool trilogy, but man, it is pitch black and it's harsh stuff. Whereas Joe Abercrombie, you're laughing most often and there's a lot of irony and you you love these characters who, you know, maybe the guy is a berserker and he totally killed someone's child, but in the next one, he's charming as hell with his one liner. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm getting away from the original question, but I think that I'm probably an example of someone who kind of cut his teeth on sword and sorcery because it's it's not really marketed anymore. In fact, it's kind of a, I feel like publishers don't want to touch it well, as much. Well, heroic fiction seems to be the fig leaf put over sword and sorcery or sometimes not even that, like something like, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, Howard Andrew Jones's latest book being called, uh, oh dear, I'm going to mess this up. I say it right in the podcast where I interviewed him. I want to say epic fantasy or high fantasy, yeah. but it was called one of those things. And he was like, yeah, but it's sword and sorcery, like hiding underneath that other label's hat. Yeah. Uh, you know. I feel like he said... He might have said heroic fantasy. I mean, yeah. I, I feel like he wouldn't disagree with that. But yeah, Howard's very sneaky. He 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 knows, you know, it's probably not a hot thing to say, oh yeah, this is sword and sorcery elements. Like that's not buying you points with publishers, but he sneaks it in there. And I mean, I, I get it because you don't necessarily oh. <laughs> want to do that there's this, there's associations yeah, we're still it, right? thinking of i think when the balloon popped in the 80s uh which is a shame because you know i don't like saying this as i was born in that decade but it was a while ago and uh, <laughs> and it would be nice if we could, I understand. We could sort of move past it feels well I mean, I'm, I'm skipping to some of my questions on the back end here so okay so it sounds like that's where we're situating grimdark all right let's get into some origin story stuff yeah. for you what was uh because you know you do you write you don't just podcast I what do. was your first published writing? Was it prose or was it something to do with gaming or? <laughs> it was prose. It's one of those cringy things now <laughs> where I read the back over and I was like, oh, yeah, I was still very much learning there. It was something that, what is that? Hor Horrified Press. They kind of do one of those where, where they're like, here's an anthology call. We want stories. And then if it makes any money, we'll split some profits with you. And so a buddy of mine uh, named Rob, we were like, whatever, man. We always kind of wanted to write something. Let's try this. This was like six years ago now. And we wrote something for Fall of Cthulhu. And we wrote a story about you know a barbarian character who is basically in chains. He's working in this quarry. They're digging into it. And unearthing a thing. They don't know what it is. They're just enslaved to do this. And then eventually they basically unearth this Cthulhu-like thing and they slay it and the guy walks away at the end. That's pretty sword and sorcery plot, I suppose. If, uh, or a, a good fantasy plot. But, you know, reading back at it now, I'm like, ooh, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that. Yeah, but you, you, I'm sure I don't need to tell you. Like, that's good. That means you've improved. <laughs> if you were like, yeah, I'd well, nailed exactly. it. Like, I'll just do this again. <laughs> that would be the, the problem. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But to be honest, had I – and we were blown away that it was, like, accepted. We were like, oh, my God, someone wants to put this in there. Uh, <laughs> I feel as though if I didn't have that tiny success, that modest success, I may not have gotten serious enough to really buckle down and like, I mean, again, I'm not like a successful author. I've had good public publications at cool places and people have paid me to do work, which is awesome, but I may not have really leaned into it. So I always say to people, you know, a lot of people will come up 
modestly and say, oh, yeah, it was a tiny little thing and it was this and that. But if someone has ever paid you for anything or has accepted your work and said, we are going to put this in print, then that's a success, man. And you should you should enjoy it and you should take it springboard and, you know, yeah. keep developing. Because I feel like I'm, I'm still very much in the midst of developing. I feel like maybe about a year ago is when I got comfortable enough to think, man, I don't suck, you know? Like I'm, I'm okay, and this is a good place where I can kind of learn more from. So, yeah, no, yeah, that that's that, that's that's a healthy it. attitude. You know, I think there's too much pressure on uh, mind blowing debuts and like the 16 year old who gets the six figure advance and all these other things that are reported on because they're free yeah. fish. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I see them sometimes as an as a teacher. I'm like, oh my god, you're in grade seven and this is what you're producing. <laughs> So for those kids, I make an effort to say, like, listen to me, what you got right now is not going to be what you're going to do when you're 20 or 30. But if you keep going, you are going to be amazing when you get there. And so, you know, if I can inspire kids too, or inspire future writers, then oh, very good. <laughs> okay. So how about another origin story? How did the podcast Rogues in the House come together? <laughs> Interestingly, uh, Rogues in the House started with Conan Exiles. Conan Exiles, for those who don't know, is a game by Funcom. Uh, it is a open world survival game. And I guess we got to go back a little bit farther that it kind of started in Conan Gaming Group, which is a Facebook group that I admin on, uh, well, Facebook. So a few guys on there, we talked it out and we were like, oh, you have a PlayStation 4? Oh, so I have a PlayStation 4 too. Well, let's go on and play some Conan Exiles together. So Logan and Alex and I... Uh, we all started playing Conan Exiles together and we started talking while we're running around in a loincloth fighting weird turtle creatures, eating meat and getting diarrhea because <laughs> <laughs> uncooked meat because it's a weird game like that. <laughs> and we eventually said, I feel like we have some good banter here. Let's try a podcast. And uh, and we did. And so we ripped out a few episodes with crappy mics. I feel like we had good repartee and we enjoyed it enough to keep going and I don't know. What are we on here? Almost year three, maybe? I think so. Yeah, I've been, so, I've been working for the house. I think this thing's been about, yeah, you're on year three. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate the listens. Anytime someone listens, uh, I mean, that's wicked. Because I, I say to the guys, like, you know, we don't have to worry about growing our listenership so much. It's like, if you went into, you know, an auditorium and you had this many listeners every night and people listening to you, you would keep doing it, <laughs> right? So even if you have a good, small, captive audience, that's success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's always nice when, yeah. like, the feeling of, hey, me and my buddies, this is fun. Will other people find it fun? You know, actually pays off. Because I think yeah. we've all listened to too many podcasts yeah. where, like, yeah, these guys aren't as funny as they think they are. Or, you know, they're, they're, yeah. it's good for them, but I'm, I don't need <laughs> to listen to this. <laughs> so. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, I mean, those ones don't tend to last so much. But to be fair, <laughs> I've even listened to some really famous ones or some, like, actual plays. And I'm like, this is lame. <laughs> yeah, actual plays. I'm not going to mention any names. You know. I, I, I will, yeah. instead of mentioning the ones that have not done it for me, actual plays I find really rough. I'm a huge RPG guy. I would would have thought I would have yeah, loved them. same. But really the only one I listen to consistently is uh, Root Tales of Magic. And I think in part that's because the players are all like improv stars and it's really funny and they take two yeah, weeks yeah. an episode and really put polish on the sound design. Like it's a high quality, yeah, yeah. fun thing. Uh, there's no like... Yeah, that's a big production. Yeah, there's no long pauses it's like people will dice or whatever and I have to hear that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edit that out or do 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 something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think my uh, one of my metrics is if somebody says squee out loud, I won't listen. I'm over it. I'm done. If a full grown adult says squee, I'm out. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's fine. I get it. We're having fun. But it's not fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> it irritates me. Yeah. Again, I mean, I, I try hard not to judge or, be, or gatekeep. But uh, listener, you didn't see me. My head kind of jerked back, and my my chin went into my neck. I did see uh, at the sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, maybe that's just because your eyes fluttered. Yeah. Years ago, I worked at a comic book shop where we sold a comic literally called Squee, and this man, it was rough. <laughs> <laughs> Sword and sorcery fans, don't say Squee, you yeah, guys. No Gatekeeping yeah, one hundred and one. Come on. No, it's fine. Stay in. It's fine. Just don't say Squee. That's all I ask. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I don't judge you. I just I prefer not. I won't say yeah, it like myself. Squee that's all. is to us, it seems, as moist is to many. <laughs> so it's just yeah. that. It's just yeah, moist or can I can I add one word yes. to that? There's another word adjacent to moist that I really don't mm -hmm. like, and that word is ointment. <laughs> I hate the word ointment. Yeah, we can carry on. That's just a me thing. 
So yeah, what's amazing about you mentioning the the word ointment is it gets me to my next question, which I never would have expected. Really, it's a, it felt like a non sequitur, but now it's a perfect segue. Uh, can you please tell us about wow. your skincare regimen? Because I have heard you have fine German skin, uh, which <laughs> <laughs> which listener, in case you worry that I'm a serial killer sizing up uh, my next skin suit here, uh, no, I'm just I'm just teasing uh, Matt because uh, they uh, on Rogues in the House quite recently were able to interview Sarah Frazetta, uh, daughter of Frank Frazetta, and an accomplished artist in her own right, which. I mentioned granddaughter of Frank Frazetta. Pardon me, granddaughter. Sorry, yeah, yeah, whoa, 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 yeah, Yeah. no, granddaughter. I'm getting my dates all out of whack here. Um, But (laughs) uh, which I mentioned as a kind of like you know segue on top of a segue sandwich here to get to me asking, yeah, like how do you? I think you kind of answered this already, but like how do you feel about how the podcast has grown and you've connected with people? What's that experience been like? Like, Never mind like the numbies going up per se, more like how it's grown from something you guys did and kind of hoped you weren't you know shouting into an empty room to now i think you're at the point where you guys seem to have like a decent little fan base and you get to interact with them and you get that kind of satisfaction like how how has that been for you well uh, i mean honestly it's it's been awesome somewhat surprising and it's been an you know we get enough feedback and comments where i mean in some ways you take those and you're flattered and you're like yeah okay good people are connecting but it's also that it's like well we got to keep doing this because we kind of hit a patch there where we were all very busy. And then when COVID occurred, like I think in 2020, like we only did like six episodes. You know, there was a moment there where I was like, are we going to keep going? And then I decided like we have to keep going because not not so much the world needs us. It's <laughs> nothing like that. It's not the community needs us. It's that this sounds cheesy and I've said it a lot, but I really love sword and sorcery. I love the ethos. I want to see it keep going. I've met so many people in the community who are so awesome. And there's this bad, you know, reputation thing that sometimes comes with it. And so what I want to do is get as many people together as I can or or as we can in the community and I don't know, help make sure life keeps getting, you know, we keep breathing life into it and that we support one another, Mm -hmm. right? I'm not even out there writing novels. I mean, you're the man writing the novel right now, which is awesome. I'm just kind of like, I got all kinds of little projects that I do, but if we can support each other's podcasts, we can support each other's anthologies, and I feel like we should. And I, and if we can take some of that scummy element out of it, which I, I, you know, I don't mind saying, it is there, and there are characters in it who are going to die hard, right? They're they're gonna they're gonna stick it out, but we're going to we're gonna re- I don't want to say replace. <laughs> We're gonna keep, we're gonna keep no we're gonna keep injecting um, good vibes into this yeah. and so I want to see that persist whether that's we work together on anthologies we share each other's stuff we work on each other's podcasts w- whatever it is I don't know it's kind of become important to me and I've been spending a lot of time trying to promote the podcast get yes I, I am trying to extend those numbers so if you if you don't listen to rogues in the house please give us a chance and do so oh yeah and saying it as someone who is not biased as a host of that podcast i would also endorse that course of action i mean why would i be having matt here if i thought the podcast stank <laughs> like i'm well, gonna yeah. link the hell out of it in the blog post and all the social media posts for this episode guys but uh, rogues in the house put that name into anywhere you can download podcasts and they should come up well thank you and i mean i really do appreciate that but even before rogues in the house like my mind was blown when um you know i managed to get a gig working on official Conan products. I was like, holy crap, my life is complete. And and now I'm kind of seeing that like, well, there's this other thing that that I can work on too. And we can kind of, I don't know, massage that angle as well. Yeah. And and hey, to what you were saying a moment ago, you were kind of like, oh, I don't want to say replace. Maybe it's more the case of like, let's grow the positive cohort so yeah. that they can just kind of maybe just yeah. kind of eclipse the guys who want to reread the same 10 stories over and over again and get mad when there's like a woman yeah. in the story or whatever the hell. Um, and these yeah. guys often also misrepresent the stuff that they're even saying they're fans of, right? Anybody who hollers about the good old yeah. days tend to not be paying a lot of attention to what the good old days actually were. And they're just, they have an idea in their head that suits their own predilections and fears and they cling to that. Yeah. And it's boring. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And there, and well, and there are elements to some of these old stories that are unsavory and they're like, we should probably put a little light on there and say, yeah, that aspect is not great. 
but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater and let's take these elements that are really good and let's move forward with this thing. I was going to say, and all the more reason to keep experimenting and growing the thing, uh, come back to our genre, elastic genre definition, because like it's already been yeah. through a, a renaissance, right? Moorcock was responding to something. He wasn't, in, I mean, he wasn't inventing something, but you know yeah. what I mean? Like his whole point was to take like, as, as I understand it, uh, Conan and just kind of pop him inside out. Uh, you know, now he's the uh, the emperor yeah. of a mighty civilization and he's uh, not bronze skinned and ha- healthy and vigorous. He's albino and he's got all these problems and he's weak yep. and he's drugs until he gets his sword which is a metaphor for drugs um and so <laughs> yeah and i mean i i i love that stuff like i love what more did with and you that. wouldn't have gotten that if some bunch of you know uh guys uh, in the 70s had been like no more that's not sword and sorcery it's only these same stories yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. by howard and nothing yeah. else blah, 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 blah. like it just strangles things that's right and to be to be honest, I hear a lot of modern authors, like even guys like Mar- Michael R. Fletcher, who we, you know, we had him on the podcast too. He would say that his biggest influence was Moorcock and Elric stuff. I mean, maybe not all of it, but as far as if you're applying it to sword and sorcery, that's what he would say. And like our Elric episode that we did, where we're still kind of like somewhat noobs, you know, we've all read a handful of stories. We covered that on an episode that remains one of our most successful. That and Conan the Destroyer. <laughs> Which is always hilarious. People have opinions about that one. That's one of the most listened to episodes. (laughs) Yeah. I don't care. Come at me, bro. I love that movie. (laughs) That's another. But that was another story. Um, But yeah, I mean, this sounds good, man. And I really love everything you're saying about just like forming a community and all those vibes and stuff. We should definitely talk more about that after the episode because I would love to hear your more thoughts on that. But we have more questions and I must do all of them or my boss, who is me, will yell at me. I don't know how that works. Anyway. So we can sort of uh, <laughs> twine together the two halves here, right? Because I talked about you know, your writing origin, your rogues origin. How has doing rogues, now you've been doing it, you know, two and a half odd years, whatever it is precisely, how has it affected your creative writing? Because you've been doing a lot more, I assume, thinking about the genre critically for your podcast discussions, right? Hmm. And talking with authors like, you know, and so on and so forth. If, if, if you're even sure that it has, you know, maybe this is maybe still, still subconscious, but like, yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I guess what I'd say is that the thing I like about the reciprocity of, of uh, social media and the podcast and whatever else, like the feedback, is that I, I learn a lot. You know, and, and and it's not just like facts about sword and sorcery. Oh, I heard about this new tale. It's that other people's opinions and takes and hot takes. All of that is that's all learning in a way, right? If you're you're getting to know your audience, but you're also just getting new angles and perspectives on things you may not have considered. Because to be honest, I was um, I was kind of thinking even just a year or two ago, like, I feel like we need to preserve what sword and sorcery means because otherwise it's going to be washed away and it's going to be diluted and it's, you know, going to be the same thing as high fantasy. And then some conversations on the Whetstone Discord, which let's shout out to that Mm -hmm. for a second. If you're not on the Whetstone Discord, it is awesome. I have given up all attempts to come up with some other venue for us, uh, you know, sort of new school sword and sorcery fans to get together and talk because it's, it's working out really well. But yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like I lost my train of thought. Well, uh, what was I saying was, right before uh, that? How has doing rogues uh, affected your creative writing? And you were talking about how like just absorbing everything by being a member of the community and learning more and having conversations like that all kind of funnels in as learning. Yeah, you know, it's not explicitly a lesson plan or something. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say it's really affected my actual writing. The number one thing as far as my prose, which I have to actually make a division between the stuff I write for role playing games and board games is it's a bit of a separate entity. The skills cross over, of course. But when I'm writing prose, I don't think so much. I don't think too much about sword and sorcery. I think I've kind of osmosis enough of it that it's just there mm. in terms of the storytelling and the stories I want to tell. But the voice, I write with a more, uh, I think I would say modern voice. Like I never try to really ape Howard. The odd combat scene will come in and I'll you know, throw in some crimson mist or something because, you know, not only am I winking, but I think that's rad, yeah. you know? I think that's those little elements are things that should be kind of carried over and, and winked at. You get a guy like Scott Odin. He's like a freaking master of emulating Howard. I don't mean like in his own Grimner novels. I'm talking more so with like when he has been hired to actually write Conan pastiche. He takes the pastiche very seriously. I don't do that. I am inspired by a lot of other writers, you know, like Joe Abercrombie's and uh, and a little bit of Howard. And I sometimes mix that up and and throw it out there. So I would say... The podcast itself and the community around it hasn't really influenced my prose, but I guess as I said earlier, just hearing all of these takes on things 
it just kind of gets in there no matter what you do. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like what I write is more in line with thing, more modern voicing in the prose. I'm not saying I'm good at it. I'm just saying that's more so what I go for. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, it's like an ambient absorption <laughs> yeah, yeah. of all things as we as one does through life. Yeah. yeah fair enough. Um, yeah. 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 So I can't remember the episode. I should have written it down, but it was one of the first ones I listened to and I didn't know I was going to even have my own podcast, let alone interview you. But I do have this faint memory of at least one episode of Rogues where you mentioned in kind of the opening chatter with the guys that at that point you were feeling almost a little burned out on sword and sorcery. And obviously you got over that. Mm -hmm. But what do you do, right? When you feel yourself getting burned out on sword and sorcery when you are writing it for games and prose and talking about it on a podcast? Like you have an incentive to not get burned out for too long because you got stuff to do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's almost a gotcha question. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's it's not, it's not. No, it's not. And actually, it, I don't know. It kind of relates to what you just said. Is it like that? Kind of gives me the answer to your last question. Is that the community itself and doing this podcast, talking to people on you know social media with with whom like I feel like I've established friendships with these people. I've never met them in real life, but we have these connections. And I don't know, in some ways, that has kind of rekindled the fire for me. Mm. I will always, like one of the last things I read that was new to me, that was, you know, straight up sword and sorcery was uh, the Charles Saunders Amaro stories. I previously, yeah, I know, yeah. we got a shout out to yeah. that. I, I previously couldn't get my hands on those because I think in Canada, they were, well, Getting anything in Canada sucks. Let me just tell you. Like, yeah, fellow Canadian. You're here, in Toronto, right? Or you, yeah. you're you're in you're in Ontario, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazon.ca is garbage, and <laughs> uh, Americans sometimes get right on my nerves when they start complaining about like shipping rates and stuff. I'm like, oh man, you entitled <laughs> piece of garbage. Many Americans I'm listening. Just kidding, I Americans. Love you. I, I love, love you so much, Americans. I love you go to too. The but I <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I know what you're saying. And please, please back all the Kickstarters. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, Amazon uh, yeah. is not even the worst, yeah, yeah. right? Like, I would give uh, the role playing game company, who are wonderful people, Goodman Games, so much more of my money. But they obviously don't have have whatever yeah. big scale deal that a company like Amazon has, and so the shipping will often be the same as the books or more. Right? Yeah, and that's yeah, hard yeah. To, that's that's yeah. just it. Like, I can't subscribe to Magician Skull simply because it would just wreck me on the shipping. So I'll just wait for the Amazon pieces to trickle out, and I mean. That's no fault to the publishers. It's just, no. that's just how things go. No, I'm lucky. My local gaming shop uh, carries it. So, yeah. Really? Yeah. I, mean, I, I walked in there one day, saw issue number three, was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Buy it, regular price. Yeah, but no see, shipping. yeah, you're, you're in Ontario where like there's just a lot of population, there's big cities. Like, I'm, a, I'm on the East Coast of Nova Scotia. Like, we got some great comic stores, but it's not, uh, it's not to the same scale. I don't know. <laughs> My God, what were we yeah, talking about? Yeah, now we're talking about, about best provinces. Um, uh, how did we get here? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, right. What do you do when you feel yourself getting burned out in sword and sorcery? How do you, how do you re recover? That's right. I think, I, yeah. Oh, the Amar uh, Amaro. The Amaro, right? Amaro story. So that kind, of, uh, that kind of rekindled some things for me. I read those and they felt, you know, like sword and sorcery. They had a bit of that Howard voice, but they were offering something different. The character's Definitely different. He's not just a black Conan. No, I'm sure the you know the publishers would have loved to. Um, well, they said black Tarzan, market it that right? Way. They said black Tarzan. Black Tarzan so they were, is right. The yeah, first yeah, time yeah. They were they That's were right. kind of foolish. I actually was just speaking with Milton Davis, uh, you know, of uh, MVP yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the, the interview yeah. that's going to go up if everything goes according to plan, right before this one. So we did talk a little bit about you interviewed Milton Davis. I I was like thinking we need to get him. On. I feel like we even reached out to him and he didn't answer us back. I don't know if you did, Milton. I'm sorry <laughs> if that's the case, but I feel like one of us did and we didn't get an answer. But that's well, awesome. I think he's Anyways. pretty busy. I wouldn't yeah, I wouldn't take it personally. He seemed pretty up for talking to anybody. I mean, who am I? And he, yeah, and he, he gave is. Me his time. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, so I just mentioned, I guess, because uh, yeah, just the what will be for listeners uh, listening to this. Odds are, the last episode they listened to, they will have heard me talk to with him a little bit about Saunders and Amaro. But by all means, please go on. Yeah, Amaro is very inspiring. Uh, it's really good stuff, and I can see how it would revive your 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 taste for the genre. Yeah, and it was um, contemporary of the time too, right? When Sword and Sorcery was super hot, which is um, I don't know. I think that's I think that's worth mentioning, right? That it was uh, of the time, but I never had it or I never had access to it. I read it and I was like, oh man, this is super cool. This is fresh. And so those sorts of moments really do help kind of uh, rekindle my interest. And I think now I really am just kind of thinking of, okay, what do we do with this now? We've got all these authors who are either they love sword and sorcery or they love it and they've written it 
and they're writing something that isn't exactly sword and sorcery and they're excellent writers, what can we do? Yeah, yeah. And I I'm, I find I'm off. I'm still studying the heck out of the old stuff because, I mean, it takes a minute to read all of it. <laughs> uh, but uh, mm-hmm. I, I am really looking hard for the exciting new stuff. And actually, uh, I'll talk to you more about that once we're out of the interview because, again, I'm here to talk to you about you. But uh, have you ever heard of sure. The Red Man and Others by uh, Remco Van Strand? Yes. Uh, and Angeline Yes, Remco and Angeline. Yeah. I, I mean, I've, ta- I've talked to them on social media. They're actually pretty big. I mean, they seem to be pretty big fans of Rogues in the House. They've been great supporters. They're people that I will probably want to have on the show later. And I need to buy their book. It sounds great. I did something I almost never do. I bought, I, I, I bought it, read it, bought two more copies for friends because I was like, this needs to, oh, wow. we need to get it out there. So yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, and they were actually my first interview on the show, uh, which was nice. Wicked. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back and listen. I listened to your Howard Andrew Jones interview and I loved oh, it. Geez. So, um, so uh, uh, yeah, they're, so they're great people. But my point mentioning them aside from just like, they're great by their book is reading their book kind of gave me hope because I was a little concerned that like, maybe I'm writing into a dead genre. Uh, you know, why am I committing to this? <laughs> ah. And then reading that gave me yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. no, wait, no, 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 no. There's there's life and there's new things to do and so on and so forth so yeah yeah for sure so i guess now we're turning the question around on me and about what made me excited about sword and sorcery moving on uh <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I just interview myself? It's well, so much easier. So I have a sort of a little grab like smaller questions here. One is I just out of curiosity, you know, you mentioned you are a teacher, right? When doing the podcast, sure. do you ever find yourself slipping into your teaching voice? And kind of now class, now now Logan, we gotta uh, get started here. Not to pick on Logan, I don't know. I'm just yes, gonna... <laughs> yes. Some no, no, no. Sometimes with Logan, he'll say the he'll take these weird hot takes with things like, oh, I love Evil Dead One and Two, but Army of Darkness is garbage. I'm like, dude, it's the same movie. The different skin. It's like, and you like that skin, like medieval stuff. You're into it. And he's like, no, nah, it's too goofy. It was too funny. I was like, Evil Dead 2 is an unabashed comedy. What are you talking about? <laughs> I actually like that Logan has these weird takes because he and I just like, <laughs> we have good laughs about it, but there's times where I'm just like, what did you just say? But it can be kind of a fun X factor, right? It takes sometimes it takes the podcast down avenues for a few minutes that are really funny. Oh, it absolutely! And you see them coming from like the title of the episode, right? Listen, I'm sure it's equally weird that I'm buying heaps of uh, Masters of the Universe action figures, playing with them, switching the parts, and not writing fiction. So, like <laughs> at that moment, so I'm not, you know, glass houses and stones and all that. <laughs> so okay, so you busted out the teaching yeah. voice on Logan and then the podcast. When flip side though, have you ever tried to work sword and sorcery? Or I, I hear this a lot with teachers uh, who dig this stuff uh, role-playing games into your classroom oh man <sighs> yes so i i designed a unit one time uh that i do with like grade seven students and it is a incredibly light rpg piece i kind of introduced them to the idea of role-playing there's no dice being rolled it's mostly here's the scene what do you do in this situation you have these powers describe it and they can either write it out they can perform it they can jot note it because, of course, we have to have differentiated instruction that, you know, if you're assessing a particular thing, how many different ways can you express this thing that uh, express or, or sorry, demonstrate that you have understood this concept? Mm-hmm. And so I've done that and I've been thinking for years, I really want to do a large scale, like a class wide D&D session or whatever. I need a system that's very light but it's still a system so that they're having to read things, learn things, um, and execute it. But I kind of have this one, should I give this away on the internet? I don't care. Someone can steal this idea if they want. But what you got to do is you got to get a handful of kids who can GM. Mm -hmm. Once you got those, and and that's actually a lot easier these days because role-playing games uh, are hugely popular. Like I have tons of students who play D&D. So what I would do is come up with a scenario such as, okay, class, Every one of you is a member of this village. And what has happened is a mist has crept into the village. And once it's cleared, the village is there, but the land is completely changed. And so now you need to basically split up in teams. You need to go out and you need to explore what's happening and report back to the village. And we'll have like a a town hall situation. So essentially I would split the kids up and there'd be a GM for each. I would either write the modules with the GMs or I would write them myself and then they would essentially play it out. We'd come back and say, okay, what did you learn? And we'd all talk about what we did, speaking and listening skills because I teach language arts. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. It's an overall story, but they would all have separate experiences. 
The problem is that's a that's a huge thing to plan, and I just haven't gotten it done yet. Kind of cool though, because you're you're reminding me of the way if you if you look at it, that Guy Gangs was really pushing D anD D in the beginning with Blackmore and all that. They were running it right as like a massive campaign with multiple different groups all operating mm. within the same. Like it was like a pen and paper MMO, and that sounds right. if I understand correctly, sort of what you're talking about here uh, with a teaching component added. Yeah, 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 and I mean every teaching language arts like D and D fits into it or role-playing games in general fit into it so well. I, <laughs> it sounds terrible, but like, I feel like the moment I will definitely do it is the moment I'm writing it for like the board of education and they pay me for it. You know? <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's the dream. <laughs> but, but to be, to be fair, I would, that is something I do want to do. And I might even have time for it this year and, you know, kind of pilot it, see how it goes, get the feedback. And, uh, you know, we'll see. Cool. It's a cool idea. Yeah, no, it sounds good to me, man. Okay, so mm. now we're going to sort of ramp out here on like uh, sort of three quick questions. Back out to the big stuff about genre. Now you have to pretend you know everything, okay? All okay. Right, so go. Uh, <laughs> Easy. Um, <laughs> in my other podcast, uh, Unknown Worlds of the Merrill Collection, whatever I'll link to it, point is I interviewed a guy named Neil Meacham who has been running and in charge of, at least co-in charge of, the Toronto Pulp Show. A big Canadian sort of pulp show where everybody comes and celebrates the pulps, as it sounds. And as you can imagine, Sweet. he knows a little bit about that. And that overlaps heavily with sword and sorcery because of, you know, Howard, Howard and so forth. I had a very surprising thing with him where at the end of the interview, I was like, so what do you see about the, you know, the future for pulps? And he was like, no future. They're dead. And me and most of the people who like them are fine with that. It happened. It started here and it ends here and it's done. And I was like, oh, so... Hmm. You know, and the and I mentioned that because of uh, we've already tap danced around this a little bit, right? But I was going to ask you straight up. I was going to say, you know, is sword and sorcery alive and growing stronger, or is it a graveyard where a few genre nerds are playing make believe between the tombstones? <laughs> and uh, I don't think it's the latter, but it's fun to say. So I I think it's alive and growing stronger. It sounds like you feel the same. In which case, sort of, you know, again, this could be easy a whole hour unto itself, but you know, short form, roughly. How? What do you think are the key things to do? Maybe like top three things to do or whatever to renew and strengthen it. Well, top three. Here's what I... Uh, I hate the idea that someone would be like, it's dead. There's no way to come back from it. I agree that I think we are in a little bit of a renaissance. Now, it might be... I think there's some truth in the whole, we're just a bunch of genre nerds in the graveyard, but I don't think that's where we have to stay. And that's part of the challenge here is like, how do we... Like we're talking about numbers with podcasts, right? Growing the numbers. And honestly, that is something I'm doing, not even entirely because I'm vain and want big numbers on a podcast, but it's like the thing needs to grow or it will die, right? It's like we are, the reason we're a small number of people post 80s is because it's not the 80s anymore. And we are sort of the ones who, you know, we clung on to the things that worked and we're still celebrating them. But how do we move it forward? And I think part of that is we have to consolidate, man. We got to kind of come together as a community. We were talking about this with Howard Ender Jones on, uh, I think it was our last episode, where it's like, we can't just be in different compartments everywhere and just sort of doing our thing because uh, that's not a community. Yeah. You're just kind of <laughs> doing your thing. A couple people will like it. A couple people will buy it. And it's not about mass numbers, but it is just about, I think we got to kind of get on the same page. So that's one thing that needs to happen, in my opinion, is we got to kind of come together. And I think with Whetstone, Chromecast, what you're doing here, uh, what we're doing on Rith, um, what we're doing with anthologies, we got to stay together on that. So I think that's huge. If you're not on Conan Gaming Group or the Whetstone uh, Discord, or you're not trying to talk in to us, <laughs> and I mean us, like well, we've we've got a good community, yeah. right? I think you should. And I don't mean we're the meeting point. I just mean we have to reach out yeah. because it's not it's not a huge community, and publishers have no interest in it. Big publishers don't have interest in saying, "Oh yeah, let's get that sword and sorcery back and run it." Yeah, yeah, I, so. I I think about that all the time with the book I'm writing. Like I'm calling it Sword and Sorcery because that's what I'm influenced by. That's what I want to write. And mm -hmm. I know I'm setting myself up for a, a, perhaps a moment of truth when I get to the point of submitting. And I'm trying to be as transparent as I can about my process on the podcast because that's the point. 
and I might have to kind of eat mm-hmm. crow a little bit or not eat crow, but just kind of, you know, swallow my pride and be like, OK, I've been saying sword and sorcery for however many episodes it's been by this point. I'm submitting a heroic yeah. fantasy novel <laughs> or whatever the hell I'll yeah, call yeah, it, yeah. you know, because um, yeah, I want it to get published and then I can go, aha, you fools, it's sword and sorcery and and bring people in through that you know, back door or whatever. <laughs> I feel like that's a bit of a Howard Andrew Jones trick. I, I'll, I'll steal it. I'll steal it. I've got no pride. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, no, I don't think so either. But I guess that's the thing is like, I don't actually think it's a, I don't think it's wrong for you not to call it sword and sorcery. If it's like, whatever's going to make it work, it doesn't change what it is. And so the question becomes, what do we do with this uh, genre? What do we do with this definition? What do we do with this title? Maybe we decide we don't need it. Maybe there's a new one that needs to happen. I don't know. I'm not getting into that. I'm not influential yeah. enough to coin a new genre. I, I like holding on to it because I think it's different enough from Grimdark and High Fantasy. And even like this is a real hair splitter I won't get into with you right now. But I even think even heroic fantasy yeah. is not quite the same as Sword and Sorcery. Although that is. Oh, I I'm agree. Just getting a, no, I agree. But yeah. It's not. And so, yeah, like, you know, again, the, the words have to mean something versus being too rigid thing comes up. But yeah. I think Sword and Sorcery is also valuable because it connects us to the history of the genre. And like I'm a guy who volunteers at a specfic archive promoting it. That's that other podcast point is to spread awareness of the Merrill collection. I'll link to that in the notes again. Why not? Right. I really care because I think we have to learn and build on the literary history. We can't just keep reinventing the wheel, by which I mean only being aware of what's been around since we were alive or even just the last five or ten years. You know, I think mm-hmm. you get better work by looking at the old stuff. Uh, even if, yes, obviously you leave, you leave yeah. the period racism on the cutting room floor, but learn something about pacing, let's say. So yeah. so I just think that's really key. So I think the term is worth keeping it alive, but how do we how do we pull it out of yeah, that doldrum of the 80s where people are like, oh, don't they mean like bad, bad, like canon film barbarian movies or whatever you know i mean god bless you canon films i've enjoyed yeah, yeah, yeah. it too but, but listen, nobody's fooling themselves and saying they're good i hear you um <laughs> so, <laughs> not. so that kind of brings me but they might be brings me to my penultimate question which i feel is like the biggie here because there's a sure. lot of discussion online about is it dead is it growing how do we save it how do we grow it how do we whatever yeah but why right what is the value of sword and sorcery what does it bring us the other variations on fantasy other genres in general you know don't again this could be a whole yeah. hour but like at its core right why what is the value of sword and sorcery? there's a couple of things that jump out at me one of them is um there's a good roots uh li- 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 li. i actually had dental work today so like <laughs> my freezing has just ended <laughs> just this for the record so i'm stumbling over myself okay, feel free to it. start it's not problem. because i had a glass of- <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a good reads group. Um, I think it's Seth Lindbergh who runs it and he calls it an earthier sort of, of fantasy. I love the idea of earthier. Okay. I I feel like that's part of it. It's a little more, um, it's sensory a little bit. I mean, all, all literature, all literature's sensory, but it's less about, uh, oh my God, we must go on this quest because the land demands it. That doesn't sound earthy to me. So it's a little more in touch, a little more personal. And again, I'm going to invoke uh, Howard Andrew Jones because I think he's an awesome dude. And I think he, I mean, obviously he knows his stuff. If you read the submission guidelines for Tales of the Magician's Skull, he's got a lot of wisdom in there. And even if you strip away, you could, you could do all that and not say sword and sorcery. And what you're going to end up with is good, succinct, lean, storytelling. It's got all the hits. It's got all that you need in there. And when I read that, I was like, I actually wasn't going to submit to Magician Skull previously. uh, Like when the call went out, I was like, there's no goddamn way I'm going to get in there. I don't have time. I'm not going to be able to do this. But essentially what I did was I looked at those guidelines and go, huh, yeah, I got a cool story here. It's like, I just need to let go of things I feel like I don't want to write and just friggin' write the things that my inner child wants to write and I did and it was successful and I managed to make that sale and I'm, you know, I'm super psyched about it, but I would say that right there, what he lays out in those submission guidelines is like, it is pure money. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean that in the way of like 1990s swingers, uh, swingers. (laughs) not like, not like, yeah, not like you're going to make huge cash. It's like your money, baby, Vegas, baby, (laughs) that kind of money. You know, I, I, I feel like, you really can't go wrong. And it doesn't mean you can do all that without the sexism and the racism of, of the earlier tales or the pure machismo of the earlier tales. And so, I don't know, follow those guidelines. Like everyone digs that. And here's one other thing I was going to say too, 
before I lose it, because I think this, I don't know. I don't know if this is profound at all, but something about it catches my attention. We are in a generation of TikTok and quick sound bites and clips and episodic television. You know, people will sit down and they'll attention spans might be a little weaker and perhaps weak attention spans aren't made for reading, but maybe the short story, maybe there's a place for that. I don't know. Maybe that could come back in some kind of sense. Maybe there's a place for it in, in the modern thing. Could Because you look at it in one way, it's like all publishers want to sell are massive novels and massive series, right? But I know a lot of sword and sorcery folks who love the idea of just digesting small stories on their lunch break. Maybe we can work with that angle. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's going to be a, it's not going to be blockbuster. It's not going to be gangbusters, but I feel like there's something there. I don't know how to harness it. I don't know how to push it, but I feel like you and I would both agree that mm, I like a nice story of the day isn't isn't a terrible well, thing. Well, and also it's a, you know, like say your 5,000, 6,000 word uh, sword and sorcery short story is also pretty manageable for recording as a podcast or, well, why am I saying podcast? Uh, yeah. the audio book, audio short story. Yeah, um, an audio book, yeah. bite yeah. size, you know, I, um, for an early episode of this podcast, I reread the short story that got me going, wait a minute, this is a first chapter maybe or a first story. I don't know, this could be a book. And so I read that mm. and, uh, you know, I, I'm decent at reading as a narrator kind of voice kind of guy. And I think it took me about, after I cut it uh, with editing stuff, it was like 40 minutes or something. Like people can people mm-hmm. can listen to that much podcast easily. Most people listen to a lot more. Yeah. I find the average length people want is an hour uh, or longer even. <laughs> I'll give you a good example. I'm getting older, right? And uh, I used to uh, lift weights a lot, but my elbows are kind of blown wow. out <laughs> and I've got a bit of carpal tunnel. So when I read in bed and I read in bed a lot, I got this heavy book and eventually my hands are like getting numb and stuff, right? And so if I could just have like a 40 minute listen to it episode, and I can just lie there. That'd be great. All right. Well, it sounds like we should talk about this afterwards. I think I got an idea going here. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 think, I, I really like uh, what you say about bringing up the, the earthier side of things. You know, like that's what I, I find I tend to tell mm. people is I love how sort of sorcery for me it always feels like the good stuff, quote unquote, you know, feels both. Um, it's almost like a, a pleasing paradox where it feels both earthier and more grounded. Its perspective is looking up. The characters tend to be more self-interested. You know, they get hurt, they get hurt, whatever, you know, but it also feels like mm-hmm. anything can happen. Like magic is weird and wild and not a system and there's corruption and to worry about. It's not going to go well. And you might run into a weird awe-inspiring mm. vista or big weird worms underground or whatever the heck. It's somehow like, and those feel yeah. earned by the grounded elements and vice versa. Like it feels like a great balance where, yeah, it doesn't feel like arbitrary. Just here's more crazy stuff. And it doesn't feel like ah, everybody's right. covered in poo and nothing matters. Uh, it, 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 <laughs> finds this weird, it, it just finds a sweet spot of like pulling at itself almost from opposite ends that I love so much. And that I think is one of the big yeah. values it brings. And also because I find it tends to feel very believably empowering, if that's the word. You know, like I say, it's kind of grounded. You don't have straight up uh, mm-hmm. epic heroes, right? That's epic fantasy. But you do have yeah. people who overcome big odds or face big, terrible things and say, fine, whatever, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. You know, Conan is terrified of the big, weird magic stuff, but he but he faces it. And I like that. Yeah. I think that's empowering. I think it's got a real optimism to it uh, that is earned by those elements I just described. And that's uh, as nice a thing as any to have during uh, this period that is a little stressful in history that we're all living through right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think that's what it really brings that maybe other genres or subgenres don't or bring differently. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there is a nostalgia element like sword and sorcery in some ways is kind of like playing with action figures too, right? You're making these stories up. They're quick. You got a hero. He's wrecking house. He's doing whatever you're sort of, uh, sometimes it's about your id, right? Like, here's what I want to do in this moment. I want to pull this guy in half or I want to throw him over the thing. And I don't know. That is fun. And nostalgia is powerful. It is powerful, so powerful. but you got to move past it. My first conversation was yeah. uh, with Howard was I was thinking about I'm not going to do it now, but maybe down the line. I don't know. I was thinking about getting a fiction, short fiction magazine going. And I love tales. And so I was like, mm. hey, Howard, would you give me, you know, could I email you a question? And he was like, I'll give you a phone call because he's a nice, generous man. And he was yeah. telling me about how when he was um, working on Blackgate, when they were a physical publication, and how sometimes he would have right. these kind of frustrating situations where he would be uh, at a con pushing it. And someone would come up, thumb through a copy, be like, oh, that's interesting. And they'd be like, yeah, well, why don't you check it out? Why don't you buy a copy? And the person would just want to reread the old stuff for the upteenth time. Yeah. You know, so that's, yeah, that's exactly. the thing to push back against. But I know what you're saying. You're talking about like a kind of a positive nostalgia and like, you know, a feeling of play. 
uh, a feeling of indulgence and in going for it rather than being nervous, you know, or, or whatever. And there's there's an empowerment piece too, right? And and part of where some toxicity comes into this genre is it becomes a power fantasy, right? Mm-hmm. And some of us can differentiate between what's actually kind of fun and isn't harmful to others and isn't sexist and all these things. And you can kind of compartmentalize things where there is a bit of a power fantasy element. Everyone wants to be the jack dude who can like, slay enemies and like, you know, get some spoils, have a few drinks and well, you know, whatever ladies like you and, or, or whatever your proclivity happens to be, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I feel like that's all okay. It's just, you can do it without being stuck in the eighties or stuck in the seventies and like We're stuck in the 30s. being a jerk about it. No, the what? Stuck in the thirties. Yeah. Like I love when people are just stuck yeah, in decades yeah, yeah. before they were even born. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and honestly, uh, the the I, I think mostly the unsavory part of the fan base are those who actually take Conan the Barbarian's actions and decide I should do that in the modern age or I'm entitled to that in the modern age. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. But, like, but there you go. I mean, I, th- I think it's just one of those things where I, I imagine you sympathize. It sounds like, uh, well, obviously you're a role-playing game fan and you're a sort of sorcery fiction fan. Mm. And I'm guessing you don't mind the odd comic book or haven't in, in the past. No, yeah, I love comics. These are all things I love too. And it's sort of frustrating to be a fan where a lot of the things that you love seem to carry a small but vocal negative fan base. Yeah. And I don't know, man, we got to figure a way to wash them out so we can focus on uh, the valuable stuff like we've been talking about the empowerment yeah. the excitement the imagination yeah and definitely yeah that's a big part of it so all right final little question here aside from the old you know where should sure. we find you um what is because i this is I'm, I'm trying to get better about this question i always love to ask people for recommendations but then they tend to get overwhelmed and go oh i'm gonna forget somebody and they'll get mad and oh what about these 10 other people so let me see if i can make it more specific <laughs> and make it easier on you sure what is the the like absolute positively just linear time work backwards as little as possible here what is the most recent sword and sorcery short story or novel you've read that got you really excited excited enough perhaps to recommend it okay it's probably Amaro. The first few stories in the first volume of Amaro really struck me as something different, uh, something fresh, even though they're old, older. I, I feel like that is kind of a thing. What what Charles Saunders did there, I think, is that could be a springboard, right? Mm. The idea that you're taking a different perspective, someone who's like, I need someone who represents me. I want to create something that's a little more in tune with uh, my history and culture and values and ethos. And you can tell he did it and he believed in it and it friggin' worked. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of unsung. I think we need more of that and I think we need to sing it. It doesn't matter who it is or what it is. Like in the Discord uh, group, I can't remember who it was, came up and I won't even mention a name. I wouldn't mention the name if I knew it. Someone was like they want to essentially have a thing where it feels as though more walks of life are represented in there, not because they're virtue signaling. Oh, I know. I saw this conversation. Sorry, Don. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just that this is the world we live in, man. Mm-hmm. And I know this a lot too, because I work with young people all the time. Things are different once barriers have been knocked down. When people aren't made to feel like you can't do a thing or this is the thing you're expected to do, you know, yeah. It's a new world and people, I think we're going to realize that human beings, human beings are far more complicated than, dare I use the term, our binaries or our expectations and traditions dictate. So I think bringing in some of that, getting that representation in there is important. And it doesn't need to be called woke. It doesn't need to be any of this crap. It just needs to be true and it needs to be honest because you're not going to get anywhere with modern audiences if you're like... (laughs) You know, the same old crap and the same old gatekeeping. It's just, it's yeah. stupid. Yeah. No, it, like, yeah, as you were saying earlier, right? It kind of, it kind of strangles the thing in its crib or whatever. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, no. I, if there are any, um, sort and sorcery, uh, writers of color listening, uh, I want to have you on the podcast. I want to, I want to get that more of that going on or anybody else who isn't just like a white cis straight guy. Cause there's nothing wrong with being a white straight cis guy. Calm down. Whoever is angry, listening to this on Twitter. <laughs> um, but that's not the point. The point is that if it's nothing but, uh, people who look like frankly, Matt and I, uh, then, yeah. um, then it's just going to die on its ass and that's not what we want. Right. Well, and it's, and it's boring, Yeah. <laughs> right? It's, it's, uh, it gets boring at a certain point. Like, I totally get the idea of like, I I get the power fantasy piece, but you know, 
it, it's everything is more interesting when more people and perspectives are involved. And if you disagree with that, then yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, like yeah. You take your ball and go home. I don't want to talk to you. Is my feeling. <laughs> yeah, um, it's fine. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, so it sounds like a Morrow. I'll, I'll link to that. Uh, Nightshade Press, Press has still got it coming out. Uh, that's where I got it uh, only a yeah. year ago, I think. Uh, um, yeah. Sorry, right. I'll link to a Morrow. Good choice, man. Um, so uh, aside from Rogues in the House podcast, which obviously I will link the bejesus out of, uh, where can people find you and what are you working on right now? Oh, man. What am I doing? God, I feel like I've just cleared a lot off my plate and now there's more coming. That's not me complaining. I okay. I. I, res- I appreciate the privilege that I have to work on all of these things, and I'm happy people check it out and dig it. Uh, just sometimes I'm tired. That's all. <laughs> it's okay. You're allowed. <laughs> it is work. Yeah. It's just fun work. <laughs> I, I, I've been close. I've been close to getting sick of doing Conan stuff, but I never went over the edge. I keep getting reinvigorated. <laughs> so, so don't worry. For me, if you just want to chat, I'm Matt John on Facebook. I am on the Rogues in the House podcast. You can check us out on Instagram at at Rogues in the House. We are on Facebook as Rogues in the House Podcast. Um, I work for Monolith Games. I uh, got some cool new Conan stuff coming down the pike. Things I can't even talk about. There's actually a variety of uh, projects kind of happening right now. That's fun. I do freelance RPG work. Tales from the Magician Skull. I sold a story there. Yeah, so. issue six, right? Well, I don't know, actually. Oh. I, I know that I'm going to be in there somewhere. I think they're still sorting out who's going where. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, yeah, that's one piece. Ooh, Weird Book Zombie Annual. Uh, I have a story in that, which I suspect will drop sometime before Halloween. I don't know for sure. I just know that the cover's out and the TOC is out. Uh, So keep an eye out for that. I am talking to uh, my rogues people. We've talked to some of our allies and folks who have been on the podcast and We're giving very serious consideration to putting out a pretty sweet anthology Mm. of basically some some heavy hitters in the uh, sort of above ground and underground sword and sorcery scene. So I can't give you a date on that. I can just say it's something that um, I feel like ties into our ethos and what we're trying to do. So keep your ears peeled for that. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, it all sounds good to me. Uh, yeah, we've we've gone mm-hmm. over time, but I was happy to do so. So, hey, uh, but it sounds like maybe we'll have to have another chat sometime down the road. In the meanwhile, it's been really lovely having you here. And I hope we get to have more discussions about the future of the community because I'm super intrigued by everything you said. Yeah, man. Thank you. And uh, I am happy to do it. I, if you haven't noticed, I like talking about this stuff. Oh, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So yeah, there'll be links to all the stuff uh, in, in the show notes, people have a look there. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for spending time with me, Matt. You got it, man. Thanks for inviting me. So I'm writing a novel features original music by Gloria Guns and is hosted by yours truly, Oliver Brackenbury. If you'd like to submit a question, then please email it to so I'm writing a novel at gmail.com. Bonus points if you record yourself and send me an mp3 I can cut into the show. Doesn't have to be fancy, using your phone is fine. Just keep it clear and concise. You can also holler at the show on Twitter. Look for at so underscore writing, at so writing. Please consider sharing the show with anybody who might like it, leaving a review on iTunes, and checking out patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel. Patrons get to be thanked in the final novel, listen to episodes of the podcast a week early, and even enjoy a bonus podcast called So I Wrote a Novel, where I read and comment on chapters of previous works, starting with my first novel, Junkyard Leopard. Thanks for hanging out with me, and Matt, and I'll see you soon.